Hello, and welcome to This Podcast Counts as Socializing, the podcast where I force my friends to spend time with me and indulge in my current interests. I'm your co-host, host, Kayla, and today I'm joined by the handsome Nicholas Orlando Landers. How are you today, Nick? Hello, Kayla. I'm pretty good. How are you? How's your week been? Well, it's been good. You know, just working. As usual. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, whenever people ask me that, I'm like... It's, yeah, I mean, it was this week, and then <laughs> next week it will be next week. <laughs> it's sure well. Yeah. So I have a question for you, Nick. Mm-hmm. What What is your biggest fear? Uh, that is a good question. Um, probably, like, falling. I don't like falling, and I do a lot of falling. In, oh, like from heights? Various activities, Yeah. It's not so much the heights that gets me, get me. It's just like the falling itself. I don't like that. I feel like anyone that says they're scared of heights is implying that they're scared of the falling from the heights. Yeah, but I don't like. I feel fine when I'm at heights. It's just like, mm-hmm. like sometimes you actually like. I mean, I rock climb a fair amount. Yeah, um, that's a pretty like realistic the fall fear. Is quite scary. Yeah, <laughs> so you would never go skydiving. I don't think I could get myself out of the plane, quite honestly. I think I just don't think I would enjoy it. Yeah, no, me neither. I feel it feels like a lot of money. I think it'd be cool, but I don't think I would enjoy the like jump. Yeah, it feels like a lot of money to spend for something I don't think I'm gonna enjoy. Yeah, but that feels like a very realistic. My like realistic fear is sex Mm. trafficking. My unrealistic fear is being lost at sea. Mm. which is today's episode topic oh would you look at that what a transition (laughs) i know i know okay so um to start i'm going to tell you this is a little bit more specific not necessarily to being lost at sea but Mm -hmm. being emerged in water for long Mm. periods of time then i'm going to go into like a little case study about a specific person and we'll go more into it um So the World Health Organization indicates that prolonged water immersion is the second most common cause of death in children and the third leading cause of death in adults for the majority of countries, with 375,000 immersion deaths each year. However, they estimate that the actual number is four to five times higher. Um, And in cold water, which is 35 degrees Celsius and lower, Mm -hmm. you are at risk of cold shock physical incapacitation which leads people to stop swimming and therefore drown and hypothermia and dehydration so the reason i'm bringing this up no which i was surprised which is why i feel like talking about the cold water yeah which is why i feel like kind of talking about the cold water is relevant because Mm. 35 is not that cold like you could be undergoing like it's still lower than body temperature which is the thing exactly like you could be undergoing yeah yeah, like you could be undergoing these cold water like issues and symptoms mm-hmm. in a lot of areas that I wouldn't necessarily right. be like, oh shit, yeah. that's really cold. And I feel like if you've noticed this, like if you've ever like gone on like a lake day or something, you like hear the water temperature and you're like, oh, like it's not that bad. And then you get in, you're mm-hmm. like, that's it's fucking freezing. Yeah. Or I remember like as okay. a kid, even I would, we'd, you know, we'd go to the pool and we'd be in there for like six hours straight. And by the end of it, your lips start turning blue. And it'd be, you know, a summer mm-hmm. day. It was, you know, yeah. the water was like not warm but yeah it so it, it, it really like, does yeah. not take a yeah. lot for it to become dangerous being submerged mm-hmm. in water yeah so let me take you to february of 2006 when diver robert hewitt was found alive after being lost at three at sea for three days in 16 degrees oh, celsius God. water that's a long time he was in a, i know i know oh just wait just wait <laughs> He was an experienced Navy diving instructor participating in recreational dive off the Mm. southern coast of New Zealand. While diving, he had drifted several hundred meters from the boat in a strong current. He then spent the next 72 hours floating on the surface and eating the crayfish that he had been diving for. During this time, he had nothing. I know. During this time, he had nothing to drink except for the small amounts of rainwater he was able to collect in his mask and wetsuit jacket. He was also able to use his jacket to protect himself from the sun, but lost his jacket on the third day at sea. On his final day at sea, he reported that he started to become very confused and disoriented. 
During this time, an extensive air, land, and sea search was underway, but no sights of Rob were made. It was only by chance that he was spotted by some of his Navy friends on the third day that had been out looking for him. He was found conscious but hallucinating. And then once on a larger boat, he was hosed down to get rid of the sea lice Mm -hmm. and then wrapped in his blanket. Um, I had never heard of sea lice. Yeah, sea lice are gross. I have heard of those. Uh, yeah, they're, uh, I got this from WebMD. Apparently, they are jellyfish larvae in the ocean that get trapped in your clothing and then sting you. Um, so as a girly who does not love the idea of being in the ocean, I'm just going to add that onto the list. Yeah, I've experienced this a few times down in Florida. Um, it's not great. It's just like, it's just like you just get like stung repeatedly and you can't like see what it is. And it's just, it's not comfortable. Yeah, we were talking about this, like, with the skiing, how, like, I'm just going to, like, hang out in the cabin. Also, with the beach, I'm going to, like, hang out by the water, not in the mm-hmm. water. That's fair. Um, yeah, so when when he was found, he said his main complaint was discomfort be- behind his knees. He was very sunburned and swollen with peeling lips, but he was otherwise healthy. Um, he said although he felt a little unstable, he was up walking the next day and was discharged from the hospital after receiving electrolytes and some oral medications. Yeah. Um, he did later yeah. end up undergoing surgery to apply skin grafts to his right Achilles regions because of the skin slogging from being admerged in water for three days. But he ultimately made a full recovery and was discharged from the hospital. And the reason I decided to talk about Robert Hewitt Hewitt, um, specifically is because a bunch of scientists were like, how did this man spend three days in cold water Mm -hmm. and like come back alive? So they did a whole case study and studied what the like physiological and psychological effects were of being in water for prolonged periods of time. And so I'm just going to kind of break down a couple of the effects that they noticed from being in the water and then things about his particular experience that made it possible for him to survive as long as he did. Mm. So the first thing that's going to happen when you enter cold water is called cold shock. It is the cooling that occurs um, throughout the, as the body tissues at the skin um, and those corresponding receptors uh, as you're initially immersed in water and you'll experience an inspiratory gasp which is the reflex that is triggered by your brainstem and spinal cord causing you to inhale deeply Mm -hmm. i don't know if you've ever like jumped in cold water and experienced this yourself but it's that like reflex of inhaling really deeply Mm -hmm. um it says and this reflex is purposeful to allow for mammals to inhale more oxygen before being submerged in the water. However, if you are already underwater, you'll inhale the water instead. And this could become dangerous. One second, Stevie is mad the door's closed. <laughs> yeah. This, uh, this, this kind of reminds me of the mammalian dive reflex. I'm assuming that that gasp is part of that. It's just kind of like a series of things that happen whenever mammals go in water i think they're like blood vessels yeah. contract near the skin and like they're yeah it's supposed yeah. to be like evolutionary like helpful to mammals mm-hmm. the issue is like just if you're already under the water now yeah. you're drowning yeah. yeah um yeah so if you inhale a lethal amount of water you'll drown and this reflex occurs if the water is 21 degrees or lower um some other things that will happen when you undergo cold shock is uncontrollable hyperventilation, high blood pressure, increased cardiac workflow. Um, so Rob in this situation was wearing a wetsuit, which helped to mitigate these initial physiological responses. Um, yeah. And he was also more accustomed to being in cold water. Mm-hmm. Um because of re- repeated exposure, Rob had done more than a thousand dives in cold water. So your body can kind of build up like a tolerance and become used to those conditions. That makes a lot of sense. I having worn yeah. a wetsuit in some pretty cold water before, it's night and day. I mean, you just it just I've never worn a wetsuit, so, well. so I really had yeah, I really had no like concept of if that would actually keep you any warmer or not. Yeah, so it's but a, I trust the scientists. It's it's a neoprene, which is like very slightly breathable. So water will come through, but it's really slow. 
that exchange doesn't happen very quickly and it's a rubbery thing. So it traps a yeah, layer so that... of, of warm water right against your body, which is super nice. Super. So that was a big part of what they thought helped him maintain his body temperature for three days mm-hmm. was that he was wearing a wetsuit. So after yeah. skin cooling, so that's phase one, your skin cools then, um, in your muscles. And uh, okay, so next, okay, skin cools, then next, your muscle and superficial nerves are affected. So this is what will result in impaired physiolo- physical performance, making doing tasks crucial to your survival more difficult. And that includes swimming, so treading water. Your muscle power falls by 3% for every degree reduced in your muscle temperature. Rob said that he made several attempts to swim either back towards his boat or back to land, but either he ended up in fatigue or lost consciousness. Mm -hmm. And luckily he was wearing, they called it a buoyancy capacitor. Yeah. I'm assuming um, some kind of flotation device. So when you scuba dive, you typically wear... So you've got the tank on your back, which is really heavy, mm-hmm. but it's also full of air. So it actually ends up displacing more water than mm-hmm. it weighs usually. So it's positively buoyant. So to counteract that, you typically wear weights. I didn't know I had the perfect guess for this topic. <laughs> it's, it's true. I've been scuba diving. So you wear weights that help that make you negatively buoyant, right? So you need to be able to sink. Mm-hmm. And as you get deeper, your body compresses, your lungs compress. So you become more negatively buoyant as you go down. So you wear what's called a buoyancy control device, BCD. Um, and mm-hmm. you're actually able to put air from your from your scuba tank into that. And it's just like a vest that goes over the outside of your wetsuit. It holds your tank. Yeah, so it's similar to like a life vest. Yes, it's a life vest, but you can inflate it and deflate it at will, depending on how your buoyancy changes as you move up and down in the water column. Or when you surface, you usually inflate it so that you can float and not have to tread water while you're up mm-hmm. there. Which is, I'm assuming, what he did. Yeah, so he he had his buoyancy up, which was mm-hmm. good because he lost consciousness a few times and otherwise probably would have drowned. And it yeah. allowed him to not be fully treading water for three mm-hmm. days. So they also think that this probably could, um, led to him being able to survive being in the water for three days. Right. Um. So... Your skin cools, that's your cold shock, then your muscles begin cooling. Then you have deep body cooling, and this happens with long-term immersion in cold water. Um, and it's, um, it drops your internal body temperature, resulting in hypothermia, which is 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So the difference between, like, a healthy body temperature and being in hypothermia is only three degrees, which I thought was crazy. Um, So I feel like it wouldn't be in water very long for that to happen. Um, And when hypothermia sets in, this affects your cellular metabolism, your neuronal activity and blood flow. Um, And early signs of hypothermia include confusion, introversion, disorientation, and loss of consciousness occurs when your body temperature reaches between 30 to 32 degrees Celsius or 86 to 89 degrees Fahrenheit. And if your body cools to 28 degrees Celsius or 82.4 degrees Fahrenheit, this is when death begins. So at the time Rob was rescued, I know, at the time Rob was rescued, his body temp was first recorded at 35.7 degrees Celsius which is just three degrees above um, loss of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So this suggested that he was able to generate enough heat to keep his core body temperature above the threshold of hypothermia, which again, probably was attributed to things like he was wearing a wetsuit. Yeah. Um, So Rob was in 15 degrees Celsius water, which is 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Which for a lightly closed cool. indiv- clothed individual has a fifty percent survival rate if you were in the water for about four point eight to seven point seven hours. Yeah. But like I said before, Rob was wearing a wetsuit and clothing, which plays a big factor in survival situations. So really, what you're wearing, like being fully clothed and in a wetsuit versus being in a bathing suit can drastically change whether or not you're mm-hmm. going to make it out of this situation. Yeah. Something else that contributed was he was also described as being a large muscular man with large mass to 
a smaller surface area ratio. Mm -hmm. yeah. And this is the ideal body type for energy conservation. So a leaner person would have a larger surface area to mass ratio, which would cause them to cool more quickly. So basically his body type allowed him to retain heat better than someone with a leaner body type. Mm -hmm. So he was whale, like he was whale maxing. <laughs> exactly. He also stayed in the fetal position, mm -hmm. which I found interesting. Dave, the the diving community has coined as the heat escaped lessening position, mm -hmm. and has been shown to reduce the rate of cooling and extend survival times in cold water. So this goes back to he was trained. He knew about yeah. the water. He stayed in this position. Okay, so the next thing that's going to factor into your survival in water is hydration and nutrition. Salt water is about 3.5% salt and will cause dehydration if ingested through cellular dehydration. The gradient change will lead to osmosis of water from the intracellular portion of the stomach and intestines, leading to diarrhea and increased um, urine volume. So basically you're ingesting more salt, which is changing the concentration gradient of your body. Mm -hmm. So it, when you drink water, instead of absorbing water into your cells and into your intestines, it's doing the opposite. You're in, you're ingesting more salt. So it's leaching water from your body right. and causing you to piss yourself more. Was he, um, was he drinking salt water? So this is my next point. Rob did accidentally ingest water because the waves were really rough right, at the time. Yeah. And this caused him to throw up. So he was losing. Mm. He was ingesting more salt water, leading to more dehydration and giving up more water through vomiting. Right. Um, and then the vasoconstriction, which is um, your arteries going from being dilated to being constricted well um which can happen from cold water also contributes to dehydration by increasing your central blood volume so this is important if you are in a survival situation you should conserve your drinking water on the first day because you will lose most of it to your urine when you delay water drinking it will stimulate the hormones that activate water conservation and you will retain a greater amount of fluids that you drink so basically, if you okay. avoid drinking water, more of those hormones are released. And then when you drink water again, your body goes, ah, oh, shit, we're going to need this. Hold on to it. Don't piss it out. Interesting. Okay. And then, it, yeah. So if you are in this situation, avoid water day one, drink as much as you can day two. No, not as much as you can. This is my next point. You should restrict drinking water to 500 milliliters a day which is like the minimum threshold like the of the amount of minimum, water you yeah. should have the bare minimum so that's just over 16 ounces so like like a soda can amount of water which i kind of felt like was a lot like he's collecting rainwater it's gonna be a hard to collect that amount yeah that's i mean it's about 500 liters right there that's a lot of water and rain is I know. Tenor. And that's like yeah. minimum that you should be so really water mm -hmm. is your main priority. Right. But I feel like you know that. Like if you get yourself in a situation, find water. Okay. So water's covered. Next, food is important, but it's obviously not as immediate of a threat as dehydration. Your body depends on energy from for food for both your physiological and psychological functions mm -hmm. so once your stored energy is depleted you'll begin to feel fatigue and you'll start to um, experience those psychological impairments uh, consuming food will increase your metabolism and therefore your heat production mm -hmm. but water is necessary to metabolize protein so you should limit your protein intake to help you conserve your water Right. So if you're if you're in a situation where you can be choosy about the food you're right. eating, less mm -hmm. <laughs> like and I was like, oh, that's a great, interesting point. Limit protein so you don't dehydrate as fast. And I was like, if I'm dying, I'm gonna eat any food I can get. Mm -hmm. But if you're and in a situation where you can be pick, yeah, go especially ahead. out in the ocean, like you know, fish and seafood are, are there's a lot of protein in them. 
it yeah, and we'll get into it. I have too, like some, but, yeah, yeah. I have some tips and tips and tricks for surviving at sea. Okay, but it, yeah, it feels like if you're lost at sea, you're not in the position to really be that choosy about what you're eating. Yeah, right. I think you're just gonna eat what you can find at that point. <laughs> exactly, but I guess you could be in a lot of other situations where you need mm-hmm. to survive. Protein might not be your best option if you're worried about water. Maybe better than nothing, though. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I find most interesting about being lost at sea is the psychological effects because it's just such like an immense, like such a crazy form of isolation, like in a way mm-hmm. I don't think most people can understand. Um, okay, so in in this study, they kind of they kind of break it down into different phases of your psyche. So the first phase they call the pre-impact phase. And this is the knowledge and training that is relevant to your situation that will establish your psychological state of of preparedness for the emergency. So the impact phase occurs when the person realizes that their life is in danger. um, And it's typically sudden and violent and outside of their control. So that's like your, oh shit moment. What have I gotten Mm -hmm. myself into? Right. Um, So Coping behaviors are really common in this phase, and those include things like prayer, thoughts of your friends and family, and planning routines. For Specifically, Rob reported that he prayed to God, and he also prayed to the sea and wind and weather gods that were Mm -hmm. relevant to his religion. And he also said that he just repeated the Lord's Prayer over and over again. Um. And then he said later he just began swearing at God, which I do feel like would be helpful. <laughs> <That's pretty funny. laughs> he the was like, reaction. okay, fuck, that didn't... Yeah, he's like, he keep going from the Lord's Prayer and then be like, fuck, that mm. didn't work. Um, but what I found interesting is they said that many people turn to prayer in times of high stress, and it suggested that um, religious beliefs can compensate for the lack of control in your situation and therefore actually relieve stress and give you inner strength Mm -hmm. and i found this really interesting like as someone who's like not religious Mm -hmm. or like believing in religious that you can have like an actual like psychological effect from it like it's kind of more just like um giving yourself some sense of control like for rob that was religion but if you can find that sense of control in your situation like it can kind of help calm you down right yeah that makes sense i mean it's also you know yeah religion is very a very powerful powerful psychological tool exactly and know? like but i it, it yeah as someone that doesn't believe as someone that doesn't believe in religion i have a, like a lot of respect for religion in the way that it can like give people like a sense of control and like Mm -hmm. a sense of meaning right and i do find that like as i i'm like not a religious person i'm like where do i find those things (laughs) (laughs) this might be where you find it he said that he also said the names of his partner and children and his extended family like out loud to himself and um he would recall his family members and imagine conversations with them and apparently this is a really common coping mechanism for shipwreck survivors. Interesting. Yeah, it says um, to talk reciting to prayers. <laughs> exactly. I, especially when you're alone. Reciting yeah. family members' names has been shown to act as a mantra that increases hope and rescue um, through physiological and psychological mechanisms. Oh, and also... Reciting a mantra can synchronize your cardiovascular rhythm and slow your breathing. So can I like actually change your physiological state by like grounding you? That's interesting. And And the other thing is that like like, um, breath control and meditation is what that kind of reminds me of. Exactly. It's like kind of getting you into that state. And also repeating a mantra takes up space in your working memory that would otherwise be consumed with the anxiety and intrusive thoughts associated with your current situation. Mm -hmm. So it's basically like, it's distracting yourself. Like instead of thinking like, Oh shit, I'm going to die. This sucks. You're thinking about whatever your mantra is. Like, is that prayer? Is that thinking about family? Like whatever that thing is for you, like just finding Mm -hmm. something to take your mind off of the situation. And I'm going to get into like, my favorite lost at sea story and we're going to see a lot of these things come at play so i think that's kind of fun 
So the next step is planning. Um, it's a coping technique that has been demonstrated um, by many people that have been in survival situations. Planning engages the brain and staves off apathy. So like it pretty much it keeps you from giving mm -hmm. up on your situation. Right. Rob said that he created a list of things that he wanted to do in life and he continued prioritizing it and like redefining it. So he like made a list of things oh, he wanted to do and then he would and then he would go back over it and like be like, this is what I need to prioritize when I get back. Like he was making a plan for when he when he got back. And this is also often used by people that are in hostage situations, just like making a plan for yourself when you get out. Mm -hmm. The second thing is having a routine that can often save your life. So it's found that many prisoners of war that have been close to giving up recover quickly when they're given some kind of like task to do. Like no matter how like mundane or like just giving some kind of purpose to their situation right. keeps them from giving up. For Rob, this was repeatedly and systematically checking over his gear. So he would just do that over and over, like check his gear, see where he was at. Right. Yeah, you know, when, when I think of those kinds of things in a survival situation, mm -hmm. I feel like I normally think of like, you know, you plan for like how you're going to get food, how you're going to get water, how you're going to find mm -hmm. shelter, those kinds of things. But he didn't really have a lot of options out there. Kind of just exactly lost his seat. So. It's interesting. Losses seem so different. Yeah. Because there's only so much you can do. You're like trapped. Like mm -hmm. you can kind of just sit there and wait. So finding a way like in your own head to come up with right. a routine and come up yeah. with things to do. Yeah. So he said um, day three of his ordeal, he was at a psychological low. He wrote, I was probably at my lowest point and I thought, just give up. You're not going to make it. I had to try, I, I had tried to swim and get to the island and I felt like a failure. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, I felt like giving up on life itself. That's when I took a deep breath, rolled over and put my face in the water. Oh, so, <laughs> I know that they found him on day three because the <laughs> no, man gave them. I don't, I don't think he had a fourth in him. I don't think he had a fourth day I don't in think him. I would have a fourth I in mean, me, to be fair. No, okay, this is, I don't know, I think this will come up later. How long do you think you can make it lost at sea? Oh, man, not long. Not three days. Yeah, but, like, also, like, the only way he could give up his was drown himself. Yeah, that's true. I, I mean, don't think I could drown myself either. Yeah. Like, you're just... I don't think I could. And starve to death? That doesn't seem good either. Right? I think I would, you'd either have to just like die of hypothermia or like go delirious and then accidentally <laughs> drown, you know? Like, I, I, I don't think I, I don't want to be able to kill myself out there. I, yeah, there's like, it also, it's such a shitty situation because it also feels like there's no good way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you either get okay. drowned or you don't. And the other thing that gets me, and we'll definitely get into this when I tell you my favorite story, is just like the fucking vastness of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Like, there were people out there looking for him, and it's like, where do you even start? So I looked into a little bit of, like, what do they do when someone's lost at sea? Where do you start? So 71% of the Earth's surface is covered in water, which is about 139 million square miles of water. And, like, also, like, it's not like you're not just looking, like, and this isn't necessarily for people, but I've seen about, like, the Malaysian flight that went mm -hmm. missing. Like, you're not just looking, like, in two dimensions. Like, you got depth to deal with, too. Yeah. So it just feels well, like an impossible task. With people, too, because they're small and they're low to the water, and, you mm -hmm. know, usually our heads are relatively dark, uh, it can be really hard to spot a head bobbing in the ocean, especially with waves and stuff. Like, I've, having been snorkeling and scuba diving, people disappear behind waves and then reappear all the time. I mean, it's like, it's super easy. Yeah, and even if you're looking there. from like, even if you're looking from like helicopter, it's like you're so mm -hmm. far up. How would you ever even spot that? Yeah. So, someone's missing, what do you do next? So the first thing the Coast Guard is going to do when someone is reported lost at sea is they're going to gather as much information as possible about that individual case. So they want to know where did trouble first happen? When did they leave port? Where were they planning mm -hmm. on going? Did they have a plan B location if they couldn't go to that place? Do they have gear with them? What kind of boat were they in? They want to determine like as many possible scenarios as possible for where this person is. Mm -hmm. 
Then they use a computer program called Search and Rescue Optimal Planning. Mm -hmm. And this software simulates the drift trajectory Mm -hmm. of an object. Mm -hmm. So they start with the type of vessel that they're looking for. So like, are they looking for a raft, a kayak? Are they looking for debris? Um, And this is, okay, I'm going to try to explain this the best I can. Maybe someone that understands computer programs more than me can explain this better, but it's based off of a program called the Monte Carlo based system. And it uses thousands of simulated particles that are all drifting at different times and locations. And then it takes 10,000 guesses for whatever scenario A may be, 10,000 guesses for whatever scenario B might be, et cetera, et cetera. And then it weighs out the probability of each scenario. And in the probability, they're including like the environmental data, such as like the wind, Mm -hmm. the sea currents, information about like the vessel, like how heavy the vessel is, buoyancy, how far. And then they're like, okay, these are the most plausible scenarios about what happened. That's where they're starting. And they're they're gonna start from where they believe they went missing and then like spread out from that location. Right. So they're doing their best to kind of like minimize the area that they're looking in because yeah. the ocean is so vast. Yeah. And again, this reminded me a lot of like when they were looking for the Malaysian flight, like when they were first looking, it was like, we're looking in this much area. And then yeah. that like area kept spreading and getting bigger and getting bigger. It and reminds- it felt like more like, it felt, kept feeling more like this is an impossible task mm. now. We're looking into so much area. Right. What it reminds me a lot of is like weather models, you know, as they. Yes. They're pretty accurate, you know, close in, in short distance or short time spans. But as you go further and further, the, you know the area becomes less certain and you're not sure about the exact timing of things because you don't know precisely how fast someone would drift if they're sitting in the ocean. So you kind of have to like, okay, we know they were here and we know the water is moving like this, but like that area keeps expanding the longer you go. Exactly. It reminded me a lot, and maybe this won't be like relevant to a lot of people, but it reminded me a lot of when you talk about like atoms and you're like, we don't know exactly where a particle mm-hmm. is at any one time, but it's in this relative area. <laughs> like, it sounds like that's yeah. kind of what they're doing. They're like, we don't know exactly where they are, but they're in this relative area. I saw a video about, um, like, Coast Guard search and rescue at some point. And, you know, the thing you have to, like, keep in, keep aware of is, like, you are drifting as well as you're searching an area. So what you do Mm -hmm. is instead of like looking at the GPS and drawing out some kind of search pattern, whether it's like a grid or I think they do this like hexagonal one where they cross through the center of a a circular-ish search area all the time. And that like lets them observe really well quickly and cover like a fair amount of area. Um, It's called like a sector search or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Like, and like, you know, they got computer programs and, like, math and shit on their side. Mm. It still feels like, like I said, it feels like a fool's errand. Like, it feels like an impossible task. And, like, if I'm lost at sea, <laughs> I'm like, they're not finding me. <laughs> the odds aren't good. They will do everything they can to maximize their odds, but the odds are not good. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, even, like, back to the Rob story, it was, like, there was a full search and rescue team, like, mm-hmm. using all of these projects. And the people that found him were his friends that were on the same diving, like, trip as him that, like, went out and they were, like, we know probably where he might around be. And it still took mm-hmm. them three days. Yeah. And, and, like, we go back to the quote I read, if it took them a day longer, I don't think Rob mm-hmm. was making it. <laughs> With that in mind, I'm going to tell you how to survive at sea. So tip number one, stay on your boat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's true. Apparently there's an old saying, like for sailors, that's the best lifeboat you can have is your own ship. (laughs) Um, It's recommended you should not abandon your ship unless the water has reached waist level. Um, Your ship is going to have a higher buoyancy than any lifeboat and is going to tolerate rougher conditions. Mm -hmm. And even a swamped boat is going to travel a significant distance and be easier to spot than yeah, one person or like one life boat. Spot a boat than a dude floating around. Exactly. So you, yeah. you should stay on your boat at all costs mm-hmm. if you can. 
they still tell you that today. It's like if your boat capsizes or something, you should stay with the boat with the wreckage. Yes. Because it's so much easier to spot you like that. And you have something to cling to, something to float on, something to get you partially out of the exactly. water. Exactly. Yeah. Um next. Make some kind of shelter if you can. Some kind of shade from the sun, because that's gonna help with your dehydration and sunburn. Mm. Which leads us to three water. Water is your number one priority. Not the seawater. That's just going to kill you. <laughs> Rainwater is going to be your largest amount of fresh water. So you're going to want to collect as much as you can. And you want to plan for rain before it actually happens. So you want to be like, I know I'm going to need rainwater when it rains. How am I going to catch it when it comes? Yeah. The nice and thing about fish the ocean can also. Is you can see yeah. the rain coming usually. You know, you got, you got a fair amount of time. I didn't think about like, that. Oh, look, big clouds coming my direction. You can usually Basically, see the rain like, coming down out of. Um, I just told my mom I'm busy. Go away. It could have been nicer. <laughs> Sorry, mom. I love you. Okay. Um, fish can also be a good source of water. Apparently, fish eyes. <laughs> fish eyes are about ninety mm. percent water. That's so good. So if you can find, if you can find a couple of fish eyes, you should definitely go for it. And this one's also gross. Snapping open the spine will allow fresh water. <laughs> uh huh. So fish do eyes fish? and spines. Do fish? You have to catch the fish first. They, though. Yeah, I know. That's but the are thing. they salty? They're not really salty. Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know. They must somehow. I don't keep eat a lot of out of their. That's interesting. I don't eat a lot of fish like straight, like from the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> um, but apparently. Eyes in spinal fluid, fresh water. You're a okay on that one. Lovely. Um, and fish are probably also going to be your main source of food. They say um, they are going to be attracted to the shade that you create, and then once you catch a catch a fish, excuse me, sorry, I am definitely drunk now. Okay, once you catch a fish, you can use their guts as bait. Mm -hmm. And at night, you can attract a fish with your flashlight. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Other things you can eat are seagull and seaweed. So, I feel like the seaweed is going to be the easiest thing for you to catch, but it's also less nutritious. So, if you can get a bird or a fish, yeah. you should definitely go for it. Yeah. I almost think the bird might be easier. I feel like I could snag a bird. We will talk about birds. We will talk about birds. They will and come seaweed back up. would not be tasty. It would be real. There's only Especially certain types like, yeah, of seaweed seaweeds... that float as well, you know? And yeah, and seaweed's floats... good, like, when you, like, cook it and shit. I've yeah. never just, like, swallowed it from the ocean. I it can't imagine. Be, it's it very good. enjoyable. You probably, there's probably okay. some seaweeds you shouldn't eat, also. I don't know. <laughs> this goes back to beggars can't be choosers. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have to eat it. You're just gonna have to do it. I mean, unless it kills okay. you. You know what? That might be a blessing. It <laughs> might situation. be. That's a good point. It's like how, like, it's like how I've always said, um, if I'm in the Hunger Games and I and I didn't have the balls to jump off the platform and explode immediately, I want to find the death berries. <laughs> like that is now my next goal. <laughs> so if you can find the death seaweed, you're probably mm -hmm. that's probably for the best. Yeah. Okay. So if you are without a boat. Your priority, other than water, should be finding something to float on because treading water is going to expend all of your energy, mm -hmm. and that's probably what's going to kill yeah. you next. If you have nothing to float on, you can float on your back in calm waters. In rough waters, they suggest that you do the dead man's corpse float, which is like, you know, like you float like with your head down in the water. Seriously? Uh, what do you do? Just yes, lay and there then you and like then lift just... your head up every now and then to breathe? Did you not ever, did you not, oh my god, did you never do this as a kid? I mean, as a Like um, in the swimming pool? Like fun, yeah, but like, that Dude, seems... Dude, okay, I don't know, I don't know if this is like an original experience or like if every kid did this, but you would like pretend to be dead like in the <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Pool. Yeah, no, I did that. So, if you're in rough water, they suggest that you float like that and then lift your head up to breathe and then like go back in that position. Huh. Obviously, it would be better to, like, have something to, like, hold on to. Yeah. But this is better than treading water the yeah. whole time. Yeah. 
for sure. And the okay. more expanded you keep if, your lungs, the more you'll float as well. So, so. how am I going to do that? <laughs> Just like make sure you're breathing deeply when you are breathing. Nick, when you are exhausted and hallucinating, well, I don't I think you're going to be thinking about I, that know, anymore. This is for like hours <laughs> one through, you know, ten or whatever. By the end of it, whatever. Okay. So if you're able to get an SOS message out, it is safer to stay near your boat for at least 72 hours as that's where, like we discussed before, search and rescue is going to start. After that, if you have not set out a message you should start looking for signs of land if you can. These are some signs of land. <laughs> <laughs> Cumulus clouds, like the big puffy like mm-hmm. cloud clouds, yep. are typically formed over land. Birds are also good indicators of land because seagulls... Okay, this part cracked me up. They're like, seagulls and pelicans rarely fly more than 100 miles from land. 100 miles? <laughs> Bitch, am I... Am I going to swim for a hundred miles? It means nothing to me. It can give you hope. Um, but yeah, give me, I guess. So seagulls and pelicans really fly more than a hundred miles from land and then head back to shore at evening. So I guess maybe mm-hmm. if you can like see what their flight pattern is yeah. or like land that way. Otherwise, I don't see this being very helpful. Also, it says driftwood and, all, all, and other debris can be good indicators of land. Mm-hmm. It could also not be good indicators of land because the ocean's polluted. So that's true, but you'll <laughs> you'll find it in higher concentrations toward land because yeah, exactly. And um, we're about to get into one of my favorite stories, but we'll we'll see some of that like ocean pollution like come in, and it it it, it, mm. it does become valuable. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah. So, yeah. So with all that background. Oh, I I should have practiced saying this name. Let me say it in my head real quick. Okay. I bring you to the story of Jose Alvarenga. Mm. So, in a Saturday, November 17th, 2012, Jose is a 33-year-old fisherman, and he's preparing for a fishing trip in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Costa Azul, Mexico. His usual fishing partner is unable to join him, So he hires the 22-year-old day laborer named Ezekiel to join him. Um, Ezekiel himself, he doesn't have a lot of boating or fishing experience, but Jose is not concerned because he has such a high level of expertise. Jose started fishing at age 11, so he has nearly 20 years of experience at sea. Um, The pair set sail on a 22-foot... Nick, where did you go? I'm just changing my pants. <laughs> Why? I'm here. Do you care to explain? I tell you a very important story and you're taking your pants saying, off. Yeah, I, I've put on shorts, <laughs> all right? I was in my work pants still. You know? Sometimes you okay, have the worst okay. pants. You gotta, you gotta, sometimes you gotta take your pants off when you're on the podcast. Yeah. I get it. It's true. Okay. So, Jose started fishing at age 11. He has 20 years of experience. They set sail on a 22-foot fiberglass boat. has a small motor, no lights, and no other electricity other than a two-way radio. Mm -hmm. This part made me crack up. They describe these as the safety features of the boat, and I will read them to you. (laughs) They have a waterproof plastic bag that they keep their cell phones in, Mm -hmm. and a barrel. To act as a flotation device. Wow. Those are the safety features of this boat. No life jackets. So they were, no they were, nothing? they were, no, they have a barrel. They have a barrel. They, have a barrel so they are very too. well prepared. Obviously. So, exactly. They travel 70 miles from shore. While at sea, a storm a begins to roll in, in and the pair, I know, I know. While at sea, a storm begins to roll in, and the pair decides if they should stay out on the fishing trip or head back to shore. Jose sells everything that they catch for 50 cents a pound. So the bigger the haul they get, the more money they will make for the trip. So they begin to kind of like weigh the cost risk analysis Mm -hmm. of this trip. And ultimately they decide that they're going to continue fishing. However, the storm ends up being more than they're able to handle and the engine floods. Um, This leaves them with no way to get back to shore. And again, they are 70 miles from shore. 
Um, and they also lose most of their equipment to the waves. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's and they begin because... taking on water. Yeah, this is a bad situation for them. Yeah. When you're in a storm, the ideal direction to be pointing is into the waves. Boats are meant to go into the waves. They ride up over them. They don't get, like, water coming up in. Mm -hmm. It's it's better to go into them. When you lose your engine, there's no other way to steer the boat. You might be able to turn the rubber a little bit and get something, but, like, there's just no... It doesn't work. Yeah, their engine floods, so they're kind of, like, immediately Mm -hmm. just at the mercy of the sea. Yeah. Like I said, they lose all their equipment. The boat begins to take on water. And this causes them to start throwing the fish that they caught over overboard so they can stay afloat. Mm-hmm. So they were like, let's let's stay out here so we can make more money. And shit just goes from bad to worse. And they're like, fuck that. And they start getting rid of the fish. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for the next few days, they are scooping water out of the boat with their hands and throwing it overboard. Were they caught in the storm for multiple uh, days then? Oh, I'm going to get to it. Um, and oh, and the whole time they're like arguing with each other. Of course. Right. They lose, they lose the, again, like, I like these are two people that don't know each other. They're not even the same age. And I'll get to it a little bit more. Like they are very different people. Like he just hired this random, like young 20 year old guy to like come out and like help him for the day. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not friends. Right. And they're about to, like, go through some shit with each other. Mm-hmm. So, they're arguing with each other. They lose their radio in the storm. But luckily, Jose is able to call his boss on his cell phone before the battery dies. And, like, just, like, get an alert. Like, hey, we're in trouble. Yeah. This is what's going on. So, for a whole week, while the storm continues... They are paddling water out of their boat. It rains for God, a it's week. Miserable. Well, they miserable. probably got caught okay, so... with the storm and taken. Exactly, know, the they're probably being carried they stay... with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're staying, and they have no motor. They have no way to get mm-hmm. out of the storm. So when it finally subsides, they are just surrounded by water. There's no sign of land. Uh, but luckily, the call that he made to the boss was enough to get the search and rescue operation mm-hmm. going. However, there's poor weather conditions, so they call off the search after only two days. Mm. They're in this storm for a week. So they call off the search before the storm's even over. Yeah. This is what they have with them at this point. They have matches. They have a styrofoam cooler, a knife, a pole, a mirror, and the clothes that they're wearing. That's it. Jesus. (sighs) Once the weather subsides... They spot a cargo ship in the horizon, so mm-hmm. they're like, good, this yeah. is our chance. They tie they tie their shirt onto the pole, they light it on fire with the match, and they're, like, signaling to the ship. That doesn't work. So they start using the mirror to, like, bounce the sunlight back at the boat. That doesn't work either. They have no luck. Jose later describes the boat being so far away that it looks like a Lego, like, on the horizon. And on top of that, their boat is painted blue and white. Mm-hmm. So they're like, they're literally blending in with the yeah. water. Yeah. So at this point, like, it's safe to say, like, they're lost to see. They're out there. They have no food, no water. So Jose, the experienced fisherman, begins to catch sea t- turtles with his bare hands. And they start eating them to stay alive. That is wild. Wild. And it just gets crazier. Jose, he's a fighter. Um, but water, this is, I, I found very ironic. They actually have a much harder time getting water, even though it just, like, it rained for a whole week. They have no water. It has not rained since. So they start drinking turtle blood to stay alive, as one would. Mm-hmm. However, they're still very dehydrated. Jose becomes so dehydrated that his tongue swells up and he's no longer able to speak. In a week, another week passes, and there's still no rain. And at this point, like, a week without water, like, they are very close to death. At this point, it does rain. And as we mentioned before, planning is very important. And they did plan ahead. And they have been scooping plastic water bottles out of the ocean, like, as they go around. Mm -hmm. Nick, I want you to guess. How many water bottles do you think they collected from the ocean? Oh, man. Hundred been hundreds. I mean, I even just, like, fishing for, like, a day, you find so much plastic out in the ocean. Like, 
we would we would pull like styrofoam coolers out and like random plastic bags and just all kinds of shit. And it just floats well, and you know, it's just yeah. I bet they had hundreds of plastic yeah, they... in that boat. Okay, well, no. now this number is going to sound small because they collected seventy. Yeah. They collected they collected seventy two, but they also collected an oil drum. So they collected seventy two water bottles and an oil drum. So, so when it finally barrel, rains, they got actually. A new barrel. <laughs> they went from <laughs> barrel to barrel okay. so they're actually able to collect a lot of water when it mm-hmm. rains so issue one water salt new issue starts they are drifting farther out into sea mm-hmm. which means there's no longer sea turtles for them to eat what does jose do he starts catching sharks with his bare hands in mm-hmm. jose's he's He's one sort of motherfucker. How is this guy catching sharks with his bare hands? I fucking don't know. I fucking <laughs> just bloop. <laughs> he they start eating the livers of the sharks because Jose's like, I know these are packed with the most nutrients. Okay. So this goes on for a while. They start drifting farther out into sea. Now they run out of their shark supply. Mm. What does Jose do next? He mounts the so they have a they have their pole still. Mm-hmm. He mounts the pole so that the seagulls will land on it, and he like sits underneath it, and he like waits until he get they get comfortable, and then he grabs them and he breaks their wings. Oh my god! And like this is like oh. honestly, this is such a great plan because he purposely doesn't kill them immediately. Mm-hmm. He just breaks their wings and then lets them stay alive on the ship. And, like, this is his way of storing meat for longer so that right. it doesn't go bad. Interesting. Like, as bad as I feel for these birds because yeah. they have, like, broken wings and are, like, starving to death on this boat, it's, yeah. like, a genius plan. That At one point, they have about 20 to 30 birds oh sitting on God. their ship. You would think the other birds would start warning them. <laughs> I mean, I know yeah, you birds, think that you, look, like, I know birds you... are not the smartest animals, but, like, come on, guys. <laughs> Yeah, you think if you landed on a pole and saw 30 broken wings, birds with broken birds, wings, you'd be like, like fucking insane. hell, I gotta get out of here. Yeah. Oh my god. Like, as as cruel and, like, crazy as it sounds, like, I'm like, that is a fucking amazing plan. I'm keeping that in mind. Mm-hmm. The other thing that they do, so they have this styrofoam, like, cooler. They use that to, like, protect themselves from the sun. Mm-hmm. The issue with this is they have one cooler and they're like sitting crouched underneath it. They sit in this crouched position so long that they both get slip disc in their back. Ooh. I know. That's not fun. So they they have like their basic necessities met at this point. Mm. They're like, we got food, we got water, we're staying out of the sun. The issue now is that their mental health is like rapidly declining. Yeah. It's been weeks. Uh, Particularly ezekiel he's the 22 year old um laborer that he's hired who didn't really jose want to tries place, he, yeah he he yeah. was just trying to get a paycheck he didn't ask for this he didn't ask for this so jose tries to help both of them he's like telling stories and like making up scenarios he like he'll pretend like oh like we're nearing shore he will like ask ezekiel like oh what food do you want like, at one point, he's, like, telling Jose, like, oh, like, I want oranges. So Jose will, like, go and, like, pretend to gather oranges for them. Um, They see a plane fly overhead. So they both, like, fantasize about, like, oh, like, what food are they eating on the plane? Mm. Like, they're just trying to, like, yeah. stay busy. Yeah. Which, like, to me, like, the fantasizing about food sounds like tortures. It does but i've heard other like lost at sea stories that like it actually yeah. helps you like feel better and like less hungry somehow. like pretend that you're eating yeah yeah so they like fantasize like oh what do you think those people are eating on the plane um they look at constellations at night they're like singing songs with each other they're literally like they're just doing anything to like distract themselves from the situation and keep the mood light the issue is that like I said before, these two guys like aren't friends with each other. They mm. don't know each other. And they're also like very morally and at their core at odds with each other. Jose was like this nightlife, like ladies man guy. He had like 
a fail he had like a four-year-old daughter and like a family that he like abandoned to like go to mexico and like fish oh and like party <laughs> what a um, what, what a man what the hell what a man who does that he, he spends his jose he Apparently. spends his money partying and going out and then like when he runs out of money he just goes out and fish and then mm. he makes more money like he's he's living a casual life and then ezekiel is like this conservative religious man so they have these like very at their core and like moral differences and they're also in this very high stress situation Mm -hmm. so they spend a lot of time arguing with each other while they're on the boat but they always like are able to like resolve these issues because ultimately like they understand that they are all each other they like these are the the this is the only person you have literally literally they're all all in the the same same boat. boat yeah they're like we're we're all in this together. Mm-hmm. This is all we have. So they always like they fight sometimes, but they always like resolve their fights and then they go back to like prioritizing both staying alive and like keeping each other alive. So Jose and Ezekiel, they try to like keep track of the passing of time by counting the moon phases. Mm-hmm. So it's been about ten weeks that they've Holy been at sea. Shit. I know, I know. They realize that, okay, so Christmas bus must be near. So they celebrate the occasion. They decide that they're both going to have two birds instead of the typical <laughs> one bird that they eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, they're fucking celebrating. Mm-hmm. Hey, good for them. However, good for them. Celebrate. Oh. However, Ezekiel becomes very sick and starts throwing up overboard and, like, foaming at the mouth. So Jose, like, examines his bird and he realizes... I mean, talk about just bad luck. He realizes that the bird ate a poisonous snake. <laughs> and therefore, he's like accidentally secondhand poisoned Ezekiel. Oh my god. Like, I feel like if I were lost at sea, the last thing I'd be concerned about is being poisoned by a snake. Yeah, a fucking and snake. And here Ezekiel I mean, I know is. I see snakes, but like, who, what, really? That's absurd. Yeah, he, I know. Luckily, though, Ezekiel does pull through and he survives his second hand poisoning. That's good. It's good, but this is a really traumatic experience for Ezekiel on top of his already traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. And he starts to become really suspicious of their food supply, especially all the uncooked meat that they're eating. Uh, And Jose really tries his best. He's like, he's telling him, like, I'm thoroughly inspecting the food and he's trying to feed him, like, small bites of the food. But he continues to. to like refuse food and he's his health begins to rapidly decline Mm. and this is when ezekiel realizes like he's gonna die and at this point he makes jose promise that he's not gonna eat him when he dies and this is where i'm like do you think you'd keep that promise i don't think i would I mean, it's like, especially for a guy you just met. Bird supply is getting low. Like, I know, but he's still he's like he's like I know I'm gonna die, but you better not eat me. And then a few days later, Ezekiel does pass a starvation, and Jose keeps his promise. He he doesn't eat Ezekiel. You know, maybe if you're trying to also... ten weeks to the man. That's true. Like, you have spent 10 weeks with this guy, like, trying to keep him alive. But the thing is, though, he also does not dispose of Ezekiel's body. He keeps him on the boat with him. Mm -hmm. To talk to and stuff. Exactly. So, yeah, so he's officially alone at sea, but he's continuing, like, these games of fantasy. And he's, like, he's talking to Ezekiel's corpse on the boat. And, like, this does curb some of his isolation. However, the issues begin to arise when the body starts speaking back to him. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Ezekiel's Mm. body begins to tell Jose, like, what a relief death is and that he should give up and, like, come join him. And this goes on for about a week of the body talking back to him. And Ezekiel, I mean, excuse me, Jose finally makes the decision that he needs to get rid of the body in order to curb, like, the suicidal ideation. He's like, if yeah. I keep this body on board, like, he's going to convince me. Because he's telling he's like, he's like, dude, death is so good. Just do it. Oh. So he decides he's going to, I know, I know, I know, I know, it's crazy. So he decides he's like, I'm just going to keep 
the clothes from his body and he just lets the body go out to sea and that's it for Ezekiel. So Ezekiel makes it like a couple months, like two months maybe. And then it's just Jose. So now it's Jose Mm -hmm. and it's been three months. He's been at sea for three months alone, two months, two months with a friend, one month alone. Mm -hmm. And that's when he begins to contemplate like what, would be the least painful ways to kill myself and like this is kind of what we were talking about before it's like there's no like there's no good way out of this situation and he's like thinking of all like these creative and elaborate ways he could do it like he thinks about like stabbing himself with like the seagull beak like repeatedly and it's like none of these sound painless man (laughs) no it's gonna be miserable no matter what no matter what and he says he spends four days they lost their, um, their life. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I, I mean, they lost so much shit. They basically had nothing with them. I mean, their safety supplies were a fucking plastic bag. Like, <laughs> yeah. They're like, we we put our phones in a bag, so we really prepared for this. Um. So after four days, he makes the decision. Hey, I'm not going to kill myself. He says, instead, I'm going to focus on living. And he starts to list, like, the reasons to live. He fantasizes Cocaine about his favorite restaurants. Bro, literally. Workers, you know, all the, all the greatest joys <laughs> in life, obviously. I literally wrote, I literally wrote, he fantasizes about his favorite restaurants and beautiful women. Not his favorite. He says that his fantasies are. No, wait, we get there. We're Give good, him a good, minute. Good. Give him a minute. He says. Um, he says his fantasies are so vivid that this is the best food and the best sex of his entire life. Damn. Um, damn. I mean, um, (laughs) okay, but he does begin to, like, look internally and, like, reflect on his own life. I mean, like, what else are you going to do? Like, you're all by yourself at sea. And, like, what he says what, like, ultimately gives him to, the will to live is he decides that he needs to redeem himself as a father. Like I said before, he left behind a four-year-old daughter, and he is determined that he needs to live in order mm. to right that wrong. It's divine punishment. Which, like, right okay, and exactly. And, like, no judgment or anything. Like, I'm glad you came around and decided to do the right thing. But isn't it crazy that it takes being lost at sea for three fucking months for a guy to be like, damn, I shouldn't be a shit. <laughs> Maybe I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah, it took him three months to get there. Yeah. You think, Jose? I wonder what you got here. No judgment. No judgment. Mm-hmm. He got there. But this is like what he says. Like, ultimately, he's like, I have to survive because I have to, like, right this wrong. Okay. So he's back to trying to entertain himself. This part's crazy. He, like, will grab puffer fish from the ocean and, like, make them puff up and, like, throw them at the birds and, like, when they're pecking at them. He says he's pretending, like, he says he pretends that he's watching a soccer match. He also, like, picks one of the birds to keep as a pet and he names it Poncho. So this is, like, his full, like, this is his own Wilson. Mm -hmm. Um, after however, the first like after telling him to kill himself, <laughs> he had to get a new Wilson. No, after first, after a couple of weeks, he does ultimately have to eat poncho. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's probably okay, dead. so probably I dead. how? <sighs> yeah, I mean, he already fucking broke poncho's wings. Yeah. I don't know what was left for him. Yeah. All right, how long do you think it's been? Like, how long do you think he's been at sea? God, it's got to have been at least like four months now. At this point, Ready? definitely like, at least four months. It's been a yeah, yeah. Um, it's been a full year. Oh no, he spends a year <laughs> out there. It's been a full year That's since crazy. he first left. It's been a, and and mind you, he's not seen a single boat. Mm-hmm. He's not seen any land. Like when you start to think about the vastness of the ocean, he's been sailing the ocean. Yeah, off the coast of Mexico, and I'll actually, I'll send you a photo of, like, his trajectory, Mm. but, um, and, like, ultimately where he ends up, but it's just crazy how big the ocean is. It's been a full year. He has not hit another boat. He has not hit any land. After a full year, um, after a full year being lost at sea, he does spot a boat heading next, like, heading towards him. He begins, like, jumping up and down, trying to get their attention, 
he says that the boat gets so close that he like actually thinks it's gonna hit his boat and he like begins to feel like this immediate relief like the whole ordeal is over Mm -hmm. he's gonna go home he's gonna make good on his promise to reconnect with his daughter uh and he's like and the but oh my god this is gonna piss you off so much the fishermen on the other boat think jose is waving hello and they wave back and then they continue dude that's brutal (laughs) do we know for sure that they were real like i guess we don't know for sure because this is all like jose's account yeah but also i don't doubt men not being able to read body language like you see an emaciated man jumping up and down you're like he just wants to say hi (laughs) yeah he's yelling at you like please help me please help me like hey how's it going and they're like (laughs) they dab him up keep sailing (laughs) so that's 12 months in Mm. it was his first sight of a boat a month later he notices the air smells different he says it kind of smells like dirt. And then he starts seeing different kinds of birds that he didn't see before. And then he looks into the water and he sees fish swimming below him. Oh, he's getting shot. And that's when he realizes that's when he realizes he must be close to land. Mm-hmm. Um, a few hours later, he actually sees land. So he gets out of his boat and he like makes his way. At this point, it's been 430. 38 days on water. That is wild. And he finally touches land for the first time. And he just like, he just lays in the sand. Like he can hardly walk. He's laying in the sand. Two locals exit the shack. And the locals are like so shocked by the look of him that at first they don't even think he's human. They think it's like some kind of animal that's washed ashore. And then Jose like jumps up and he starts like shouting in Spanish at them. And the locals like oh my god so they bring him inside and they start cooking him pancakes (laughs) that's a man so they they they're cooking him pancakes yeah and they say that they just keep cooking him like pancake after pancake after pancake like over and over (laughs) famished (laughs) um yeah i mean if i have like only been eating fucking birds for 13 months Mm -hmm. a pancake is gonna hit so fucking hard yeah um, and I'm going to send you this picture. It's his route at sea. So you can kind of see where he ended up. And then I'll send you another one that shows. Um, fucking hell. Kind of shows like. Um, the timeline of where he was like mm-hmm. at each. Yeah. Oh, I can't figure out how to send the image. This is harder than I thought. Give me a sec. Oh, I should just invite you to this Google Doc. Oh, yeah. We got to pause for a second. I'm going to piss my pants. Okay. Just don't listen to me pee, okay? You can mute yourself. Okay. Can I mute her? Do you hear that? 
Uh, well, I took my headphones off, so. Oh, you're so polite. I, went, I did hear it, and I tried, I, was to, sitting I tried to figure out how to mute you, and then I was like, all right, I don't want to listen to her peeing. So I, just... I was, it went on for a long time, too, and I was like, damn, this bitch is loud. <laughs> we'll cut that. We'll cut that in the in the final recording. No, there'll have to definitely be some editing. Mm. Um, I don't know how I'm going to do that. If not, the world's just going to have to listen to me piss. We can try it. I'll figure it out. I'm very mm-hmm. smart. Mm-hmm. I'm going to see if I can figure out how to send these images to you. I might just invite you to there my Google Doc. There is a chat, isn't there? Is there a chat? I don't yeah, know. Bottom What's right, your email chat? link? Uh, NickOlanders at gmail.com. we got to cut that. Nick. Oh. No, you don't want me to leak your email. No, I should I should be as well. I should have gone when you were gone. But okay, you go to the bathroom and while I figure out how to send this. Ahoy. Okay, check your email. Got it. Lost AC. Okay. Yeah. Oh my god. (laughs) (laughs) Scroll to the bottom so you can look at this map. Don't read my notes. Okay. Uh, Which is first map, second map? Both. Uh, They're both maps. Mm -hmm. Okay. This like first map here um, shows you where he started and where he ended, and mm-hmm. we'll talk a little bit about this island. And then yeah, okay. So for the our, bottom map for shows audio, you like you are, for our audio listeners. He's he yeah. Go ahead and describe this map. The southern portion of uh, the Pacific coast of Mexico. So pretty much the worst place you can get lost at sea. I mean, there is nothing out there. It's not like the Atlantic where there's lots of islands to run into. It's not like even the North Pacific where there's a little bit more or like somewhere off Asia. I mean, like Southern Mexico, Pacific Ocean. If you, he he traveled mostly west, a little bit south. He kind of came down toward the equator, but mostly got Mm -hmm. carried straight west. And there is just absolutely no land out there for hundreds and thousands of miles so no, and like um so he lands on this island called Iban Atoll and it's part of the Marshall Islands and mm-hmm. it's like it's honestly miraculous that he even ends up hitting this because it's this a small island that's part of a small group of islands and mm-hmm. he just is like kind of lucky that he ever ends up even hitting yeah. them yeah the Pacific is is very <laughs> expansive and there's not a lot of land out there and that's what's crazy to me too is like he doesn't like 
yeah, he had one kind of boat encounter, but he never really like runs into another boat. He just mm. kind of luckily ends up back at land again. How long after between the boat encounter 13 months. and landing was it? Because he had so to the have boat been encounter land. happens exactly. The boat encounter happens at twelve months, and then a month later is when he sees the island and okay. exits the boat. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense because he was near. Exactly. And the Marshall Islands are pretty he, yeah, wide. So he was, yeah, yeah, so he was kind of near land when he saw a boat, but they mm. didn't help him. And then he eventually just lands, hits land again. So um, so we were at the part where the locals are feeding him pancakes. Mm-hmm. And then they uh, contact the U.S. Embassy and report that they find Jose. And then they take him to get medical treatment. Yeah. So, um, Jose learns at the hospital that he's traveled from the coast of Mexico to this tiny island called Ibon Atoll, Mm -hmm. um, part of the Marshall Islands. And he has traveled at this point, it's estimated at the minimum that he traveled 5,500 miles. Oh, God. And it's, he's like in remarkably good health at this point. Yeah. His only real complaint is that he has swollen ankles. (laughs) And he also has, he, this really isn't even a complaint. The doctors just noticed this when they examined him, is that he also has parasites from consuming the raw meat. Yeah, that's And so. then, yeah, yeah. And then later on, he will develop anemia from this whole ordeal. Mm-hmm. But that's like a little while after when he's like first found. Yeah. So um, the news breaks of his rescue the day after he's found, and people are, like, absolutely astonished by his story, and they immediately began to, like, deny that this has happened and just think he's lying. They think, like, there's no way someone was at sea for 13 months Mm -hmm. and, like, still be alive. But, of course, there are records of his um, initial disappearance from Mexico and that initial search and rescue that happened over a year before. So, like, they are able to corroborate his story. Like, this is the man that they were looking for. I know. It's insane. And, like, you think about, like, okay, even, like, during COVID, like, when we're in lockdown in isolation, Mm -hmm. like, we still had, like, our families and, like, Mm -hmm. contact with people. Like, like, we've never, like, experienced isolation like that where you were, like, not talking to anyone else. And he had Ezekiel with him, but he only had Ezekiel with him for... 10 weeks of the whole over a year and a half that he was at sea he was barely there and it was crazy too because when i like found out that ezekiel had died i was like damn you made it 10 weeks like you made it so long yeah but he had so much longer to go to 10 weeks and i was like oh this thing's gonna be wrapped up in 12 and it's gonna be like i know could have only hung on i know when i heard like oh like exactly when i heard ezekiel like Dad, tell me, so I was like, bud, you're so close. And he wasn't. No, he, he was really not. wasn't. He had quite a ways to go. He had so much ahead of him. So, so he's found, and the news, like, the news of this whole ordeal, like, it spreads like wildfire, including it gets back to his family, who just assumed he was dead yeah. the whole time, including the daughter that he abandoned. Mm-hmm. So after this, he is able to return to return to El Salvador, and he reunites with his family, and he reconnects with his daughter, and it's like That's this nice. whole like beautiful thing, mm-hmm. and he, like he's able to make good on that promise. But he also does really struggle afterwards because he's been through this traumatic experience, and he is um, he's like on top of that, he's flooded with all these people coming to him and they're like curious and they want to like mm-hmm. report on his story. And he's been in isolation for a year and now he's like surrounded by all these people. So it's like, it's so much for him to cope with. Yeah. And he also starts to become really paranoid about the parasites that he has. And he thinks that they've like made their way to his brain and they're like eating on his brain. Mm-hmm. And he also like develops this really obviously this big phobia of water um which and like and fishing was his livelihood so Mm -hmm. and it it takes him it takes him months to like be able to return back to the water again Mm -hmm. and on top of that he's filled with all this trauma and guilt about ezekiel's death and like watching him die so like that's a lot to unpack um 
but after a while, he, he is able to, like, come to terms with all of this. And um, an author reaches out to him. And, like, talking about his story, like, really helps him, like, cope with all of this. And they publish a book called 438 Days about this whole ordeal, his 438 wow. Days at Sea. Mm-hmm. And, like, yeah, and he lives to tell the tale. And it's crazy, too, because he really, like, Oh, not crazy, but I think it's interesting that he does do a lot of these, like, um, coping and, like, survival skills that they talked about, like, in Rob's case, like, mm. of his, like, three days, like, this microchasm, like, this whole ordeal, yeah. like, the, he keeps a routine, and he's, like, um, fantasizing, yeah. and he has, like, these different mantras, and he's planning right. ahead, Wake and up at sunrise, he has this, you know, ex- break the chicken wings, break the bird wings, <laughs> break um, wings, have count my birds, collect you know, trash take from the ocean, the water, look out, yeah. talk to the corpse. Yep. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he and and honestly, like his um, twenty years of fishing experience, like really does come in hand. Mm-hmm. Like he's yeah. like catching like sharks with his bare hands, mm-hmm. like. Like, I mean, he, he did the damn thing. Right. Yeah, there is, you know, uh, some f- certain fish and, you know, sea turtles and, and stuff like that really like to hang out under floating debris. It keeps them a little cooler under the exactly. surface. Um, it gives them something to hide, but like, on and around. Sometimes there's, a lot of times you get, like, small fish that actually grow up in, like, seagrass or other uh, floating debris. Um, like, things like baby crabs will sometimes start their lives there you know so there's like fish will come to a floating object like that and eventually you'll start growing barnacles and kind of develop a whole little you know ecosystem, ecosystem like on, on the whole exactly the boat. so yeah i don't know if this is like as well. i don't know if this is just like pure delusion but like i'm convinced that if i was in this situation and i needed to like catch a fish with my bare hands i could I have I ever figure it out. No. You know, you've got unlimited time out there. Exactly. I got fucking 13 <laughs> got months to figure to it out. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, as impressed as I am with the survival skills, I'm like, I could do that too. <laughs> um, But I think the big takeaway for me is um, don't go out to sea. <laughs> <laughs> or at least don't go out I think to it sea just confirms... in a really crappy boat. And yeah. I think it just confirms, like, my most irrational fear of being lost at sea. Like, I just want to do that. I simply just want to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely, you know, sea's a lot bigger than we are. Um, you know, the the, earth, the world's gotten smaller, but the ocean's just as big. Yeah. I mean, his whole story really just put in perspective to me, like, how fucking big the ocean is. Yeah. He was just floating and didn't hit land mm-hmm. for a whole year. I've gotten that sense just never a few hit times. Land. You know, we'll go out fishing, and, and it doesn't take very long to get out of the visual range of land. Like, you only have to go... And that's down scary! The Keys, you know, because the Keys are so low-lying. Um, mm-hmm. All of Florida is so low-lying. You only have to get, like, 20, 50 miles off the shore, and you can't see land anymore. And God, it's so scary, but also it feels... water out there is so isolating. You are like, oh my god, I am like... It is. It's so nothing. scary... But then there's also that part, like, when you're doing it, that you're like, this is so worth mm-hmm. it. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. like, do you remember on spring break when um, when we took the boat out and fucking we saw all those, like, manta rays? Oh, that was so cool, yeah. That was so cool. And I was like, and obviously, I, like, I mean, I fell asleep the whole time. Like, we weren't mm-hmm. really all that far off of yeah. the coast of the ocean. But I was like, oh, my God, like, I like, this is my planet Earth moment. And, like, it was just, like, everything all together was just, like, mm-hmm. just, like, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I do love boats and I do love the ocean. I love, I love boats. And but I it is scary. Too. But, yeah, it's a, it's a big, scary place. And you don't want to go out there if you're not prepared. And this guy. I don't want to be out there for 13 months alone. No, that is for me sure. neither. With no one else around? Yeah, no thank you. I like a nice pleasure cruise and some fishing, but I don't want to be out there any longer than, you know. I would like Nick, to sleep in my bed at night. Let's say we're lost. Let's say we're lost at sea together. Mm. Question one: Which one of us dies first? Which one of us is Ezekiel? <laughs> um, I don't know. I feel like 
I want to say me because I think I would eat something that was like questionable and then die. <laughs> you think you'd eat the poisonous snake? <laughs> I maybe, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't stop eating after that. I would keep on eating. You know. Oh, you think you'd power through? Yeah. Interesting. Okay, yeah, I'm because I'm just oh, I'm like okay. Let's say Nick dies first, and I'm on the ship. I'm not against eating you, mm-hmm. even if you make me promise not to. I don't think I would promise. I would. I think but I understand ha- the situation. I think you'd make me promise to. I think you'd make me promise to eat you. Yeah. But I, then I'm thinking, how would I go about that? Because it's not like I can cook you, and I I don't have a knife. Yeah, and the you can't like. There's a, there's so do I just start taking bites? Yeah, there's a clock on the. Uh... Start. I'm. <laughs> I'm starting with your dick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm eating it like a popsicle. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I don't know if I could bring myself to like physically bite into someone. Like, yeah, just, I'm like, like, I don't know how I'd go about you know? that. Like, I know I could definitely eat a person. Like, let's say I'm lost, I'm stuck on a desert island. Mm. If I could, cook and like, them. I can like build a. F- yeah. Exactly. I can make a fire. I can cut you up. That seems easy. On a boat, I'm like, do I just pick up your arm, still attached to your body, and start gnawing at it? It doesn't feel right. No, it doesn't. Yeah, and I'd and probably you, you still do, do it. you gotta do it pretty quick, because, you know, the decomposing and the, the rotting and the meat going bad sets in pretty soon, so you gotta make that decision fast. <sighs> I think maybe I'd I go for, like, cut, a couple even bites. Even if I could just cut it up, you know, and not have to be like, oh, I'm eating a human but- arm right now. I could be like, oh, that's exactly. a piece of chicken, whatever. Honestly, you I'm know? starting to think about it. And even like, even like if I had to like take your clothes off to keep your clothes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd be like, ew, Nick's naked. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I, maybe I'll just hope to go first. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, that's <laughs> everything I have for you. I don't know how to end, end this. Yeah. Wow. What is st- I 14 days 14 months. It's a long time to be out there. 14 days. 14 days. Even 14 he days wishes. is a long time to be out there. 3 days. Is I know a long it time it to really puts it, it makes the I know it makes the 3 days seem like nothing. I mean, you're he like didn't have a boat, first, you're like oh, 3 You know. That sure, was, he was that 3 was days him. just in water, yeah. which is a very different situation. Mm-hmm. But I mean, yeah. it either way it sounds terrible. All right. Well, that's all right. Well, that's what that was. Uh, Thanks for listening. This has been um, this podcast is technically socializing. Uh, We've been your host, Kayla and Nick, and uh, thanks for listening. (laughs) Thanks, Nick, for doing the whole outro for me. I love you. No problem. Let me figure out how to stop recording.